I'm here today with Jean-Pierre Isbouts, who is an award-winning documentarian, filmmaker, and I've asked him to talk with me about what I like to call media grammar. Mm. We teach kids how to write, and when we do, we teach them what we call grammatical conventions how to avoid fragments and run-ons and how do we use point of view and all those things that make writing essentially portable from one person to another because the the rules and the conventions and the perspectives allow us to share writing and share communication in a way that allows us all to sort of understand what's going on well fast forward to today we now have a lot of new media in the classroom but we're not teaching media grammar and would you say there is a grammar that relates to using media? Oh, absolutely. And of course, in the professional field, it's very com complex. Uh, we typically have a crew of over 50 people mm -hmm. to do all kinds of different uh, functions, which we call uh, different departments. But when you look at media grammar in an educational setting, what it boils down to is just basically five major concerns. And they're very easy to learn and to apply. First of all, choice of equipment. You have to have a reasonably decent camera, not very expensive, but a camera that is equipped with some of the most essential features that we're going to need. Two, it's about lighting. Good lighting is everything. And just like the visual is important, so is the oral component. So audio is another very important consideration. Fourth, framing, angles, camera angles. And five, the setting. In which environment does this interview or this media act takes place? Those are the five points that we're going to look at uh, in this book. Okay. And if we have an opportunity, we might look at a couple of things like the appropriate and inappropriate use of music, perhaps. Oh, yes. Most certainly. <laughs> something that I bump into all the time. Yes. And the inappropriate and appropriate use of transitions. I can't tell you how many times I've been looking at student work and they go from one scene to another with barn doors and checkerboards and all those things that make you go bump. And I think if I had to put it in a sentence, what I don't want to do when I watch student-created media is bump. I just want to sort of pass through the technical aspects of it and get right to what it is they're trying to show me. Absolutely. Transitions should never make you aware that they're there. Right. And there's only two transitions that we'll be looking at, cuts and dissolves. Cuts and dissolves. Okay. Those are the only two that we're going to be using. Sounds great. Okay, let's get on with some of the practical aspects of media grammar. Let's do it. Jean-Pierre, let's talk about audio. Okay, yeah. And we have a saying in the media business that the image gives you the information and the audio tells you how to feel about it. So audio is really important. You, and I have a, a rule sort of that I like to use is you want to mic the person if you've got a performer and not the area. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Uh, actually, it, uh, for me, audio is so important that when I edit any of my films, I start with the audio component. I first lay down the music bed uh, and then the dialogue before I even worry about visuals. Um, visuals give you the information, but audio gives you the meaning. And therefore, uh, it is so important that we remember the audio component in audio visual. Audio goes first, audio visual. And yet for many first time videographers, audio is an afterthought, you yeah. know. And as we saw, it's important to have uh, to, to be able to use a lavalier mic because it just gives you a crisper sound. Otherwise, you sort of sound like this when you use the microphone that's built into the camera. And how defeating is that? You, you, that's not what you're after. In fact, we can demonstrate it. Okay. Uh, uh, let's do it. Let's I mean, do that. So here we are talking with both lavaliers. And when we refer to a lavalier, that is typically a little microphone that is clipped to the person's shirt. And then there is a cord leading away to either a transmitting device, if it's a so-called wireless lavalier, or to a wire that goes straight into the camera if it's so-called wired lavaliers. Right. Sounds great, right? Sounds good. Sounds good. You can hear it, right? Yes. Now let's do the same by using the microphone on the camera, which is what most people do. Most people use they say, hey, the camera has a microphone. Why? And it's easy. And it's easy. Right. Just roll it. But look what happens when we use the mic built in to the camera. Okay. So 
So, so here we are. We've taken off our lavaliers, That's or right. we've unplugged them. We're we still have them on, yeah. but we've unplugged them, and we're using a different camera, sort of a typical kind of uh, consumer quality camera. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Okay, and this is the audio you get, and you're going to see that here that it's just not probably what you want, especially when it comes to storytelling. The whole point is to tell your story to hear your story. And to hear the emotional depth in the voice right. of the person who's telling the story. It's very hollow, so all the ambient noises that you hear and you know reverberate in in this studio. So uh, this and is it, not what you want. And it tends to be a little bit modeled and so on. So no, this isn't what you want. Let's go back to our lavalier use. Okay. And here we're back with our lavaliers. Our lavaliers sounds are back better. on. <laughs> I'm sure it sounds much better. Yes. We have a lovely model who agreed to appear on our shoot and uh, with Kathy I would like to demonstrate the use of lighting. Now typically in professional filmmaking we make use of what we call three-point lighting. Uh, the main light, the master light, uh, lights the face for about three quarters as you can see here. But there are still some shadow parts on this side. And to deal with that, we use two other lights. One is called the fill light. So we get an overall view of what Kathy looks like. However, this top here on her hair is still fairly flat, and she has some beautiful hair. So for that, we use a top light. And look what happens when Jason turns on the top light. See that? All of a sudden, we have a really nice, rounded view of her beautiful hair. We see the texture of the hair coming out. And this is basically the way we shoot interviews for professional films like the film we did on Walt Disney where we shot 77 interviews using exactly this setup. Of course, in schools, you don't always have this fantastic equipment. And so there are many other ways to create more or less the same effect, simply by using daylight. So let's take a look at that. A lot of time in schools, the best light you have is natural light that's streaming through the windows. You've got your overhead lights, so those can only do so much. So we're going to take a quick look at how you can use outside lighting. The first thing that we're going to do is Jean-Pierre is going to go ahead and take a look at Kathy here, who's standing in front of a window. Now this is a photography infraction that occurs quite frequently. And notice because the light is behind her, it's washing out her face entirely. Well, it's dark, you can't see it. So the idea is to take that light and put it on her face. So the next thing we're going to do is ask Kathy to sit right there. And we're going to do sort of a half light on her face right there. Notice you get soft light that lights about half of her face. And then to fill up the other half of Kathy's face, we could take a professional reflector like this, put it right about here and catch that other light. But here's the good news, you guys. You don't have to have a professional reflector. You can use a piece of white paper, a whiteboard, whatever you have handy. Anything that will bounce that light. Hi, Jean-Pierre, you're behind the camera and you're gonna help us understand how to frame a subject. Because a lot of people will just sort of turn on the camera and they'll shoot somebody from head to foot. And I understand that's not really the way to do it. So what's the first rule? Well, the first rule is, as you see right now, Kathy is facing the camera directly as if she's in the Beverly Hills Police Station getting, getting her mug shot, the mug shot taken. So we want to change that. So we would like to have Kathy turn three quarters to her right. And you can see right away, when you turn a person like that, mm -hmm. you can see more the rounded look of her face. You get a sense of who she is rather than just the front of her face. So we call that the three-quarters view, or in a very French term, trois quarts, the three-quarters view. Okay, should she still be directly looking at the camera as she's angled? Well, this is a num very important thing because typically you would expect the interviewee to look at the camera. We don't want to do that. We would like the person who asked the questions slightly off camera against the eye line. In this case, to the left of the camera. So, Kathy, follow my hand. Here you are looking at the camera. And now follow my hand. Go to the left. 
Okay, now look, now she is looking exactly where we want to be. She is still engaged and she is just looking past the camera. Now look what happens if the interviewer is too far removed and she falls. She's no longer engaged. She's looking away from our frame and it looks very awkward. She seems like she's no longer interested in the story. So it's very important to bring her eye line slightly off center of the camera where we feel we can really get involved in her story, but she's not looking at us directly. Gotcha. Anything else? Well, what other videographers will do first time typically is look at and put uh, Kathy smack in the center oh. of the frame. We don't want to do that. We always want to move the person slightly off center. Mm -hmm. So there is depth to the perception. She always speaks towards empty space and we can sort of project a Let sense of what's step to come. out so people can really see exactly what that looks like. so this would be our final shot so you can see now Kathy is looking off the camera the time the eye line is off camera her face is three quarters and she is positioned slightly off the center line of the viewfinder this is the optimum position This is about the media grammar of camera angles. Now we might think we can just point a camera at something or somebody and no matter whether we're looking up, looking down, what, uh, however it is we're standing or whatever angle it is that we're using as we shoot that, it's all gonna be the same, not true. There is meaning implicit in the angle that we use and to demonstrate that fact, I'm going to ask Kathy to say, I have never taken money out of my mother's pocketbook four different times using four different camera angles. And you watch what happens to your perception of Kathy, whether you believe her or not, based solely on the angle. Kathy, go ahead. This is straight on, and this is angle number one. I have never taken money out of my mother's pocketbook. Okay, this is shot number two. This is an up angle shot and Kathy's going to repeat the same thing. I have never taken money out of my mother's pocketbook. Notice how the up angle gives her a sense of authority. You actually believe her. This is angle number three. We call it a down angle shot and Kathy's going to repeat exactly the same line. I have never taken money out of my mother's pocketbook. Notice how the nature of the angle makes you go I'm not so sure. This is the last angle. I call it a moving angle. Imagine one of those times in a news clip where a reporter's trying to chase somebody down, they're trying to ask him a question, and they're walking away. So imagine a reporter's chasing Kathy and saying, so Kathy, did you ever take money out of your mother's pocketbook? I have never taken money out of my mother's pocketbook. You can't trust that. Well, we're here to discuss the range of cameras that you can get these days, starting with a $4,000 professional camera right on down to your iPhone and everything else in between, which includes consumer level gear and sort of high-end cameras. So let's start up here. Can you tell us about this? Well, that's a wonderful camera. It's called a, a Canon uh, A1. And in fact, I shot uh, Operation Valkyrie, which ran on the History Channel. Uh, with several of those cameras. They're, they're magnificent high-definition cameras, but obviously uh, beyond the budget of most educational institutions. This though, uh, the mid-level uh, consumer camera is becoming more popular, wouldn't you say? Oh, I would say these are the kinds of cameras that you can actually go to Costco and buy for these days two, three hundred dollars actually. And the interesting thing is that some still work with the tapes, but others record to a flash card, which makes it sometimes easier to import it into your computer for editing, which we're going to talk about in another session. Right. What do we have here? Now, this is very interesting. Uh, the most recent line of SLR photo cameras, as this, this Nikon 5100, now have the ability to also do high-definition video. And I chose this camera 
because it has a very good CCD chip, and the CCD chip is what really translates the visual information into digital bits and bytes that your computer can see. And the uh, encoding qualities of this camera in terms of high definition television, 1080p high definition television, is outstanding. That's wow. why I bought this camera. The other thing to remember, of course, as we will hear in our audio segment, is that it's very important that whatever camera you choose has an independent audio input for an external microphone. Absolutely important. And that's when it becomes particularly important with digital storytelling when you have people who are actually telling a story versus sitting at a computer and recording into the computer. You're going to want them to wear a lavalier mic like we're wearing right now. And so in order to do that, your camera has to have an external mic input. So just be aware of that when you go to buy something. But the most important thing of this whole picture that you see here is actually not the camera. The most important thing is the tripod. Mm -hmm. No matter what camera you use, and I don't care if it's a very cheap camera, even the uh, iPhone video capability or any other uh, telephone you're using, please hold it still. What makes video amateurish looking is if it's jittery like that. So what, no matter what camera you're using, please use a tripod to keep to keep it stable and these tripods like here for example this one goes for as little as $29 at okay. Amazon. Okay and if you don't have a tripod look for a flat surface that you can set something on. You just have to improvise the whole goal here is to make sure you're not moving the camera and that can only happen if the camera is still. The best way to do that is to set it on a flat steady surface. We're going to talk about visual noise and basically that means seeing everything that's in the frame not just the thing you're shooting but being aware of everything else that's in the frame because it can compete and contrast and so on in ways that you don't want so let's take a look at some inexpensive ways to provide backgrounds and so on and backgrounds are very important because we all know you know the famous picture of a girl with uh, a tree growing out of her head or a, a light growing out of your head. You know, you're not aware of it. You right. know, when you take the picture, you're so, you're so enthused and so focused on the person and you don't realize what's going on around it. So right. absolutely. The way I usually uh, handle that is to, to bring a backdrop. Mm -hmm. And what we have right here is, uh, of course, a professional backdrop. This is the backdrop I use in uh, our Walt Disney picture. Mm -hmm. And it sits on a, on a big frame. Uh, something like that will, of course, cost several hundred dollars, but you don't have to spend that much money. Uh, if you, uh, for example, here is a company called Photoflex, and they make a very simple black doll, so it doesn't reflect the light. Okay. Very velvety, very nice velvety black. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can just clip that uh, against the wall or against the school board or anything like that. And this is... This is $90. Okay. And it will really give what we call black limbo in the background. So you only really see the face of the person that you're interviewing. Now, entirely different effect, which is what very hip these days, Apple uses it a lot, is a completely white background. Okay. Now, how do you create that? That's a very <laughs> a difficult thing to do. Not really. A company called Savage, Savage Paper Products, they make these great ro white rolls. See that? <laughs> See feel how sturdy that is. Oh, it is. It's very thick paper. Okay. And, and this roll of paper, which you can just, again, roll out and make it in a nice curve against the wall, clip it with clippers against the school board, okay. run it straight down so you don't have any shade or anything like that. Is This roll is $28. Gotcha. So, savage paper products. So, there, there are many ways to make a professional-looking background for not a lot of money. And I should add that I have a sheet, a lot like the other sheet you showed us, the black one, that's green, specifically for green screen storytelling. Cost about $100 and I travel with that and it's very easy to set up and take down. So here's the bottom line, beware visual noise. And the only way that you can do that is to be aware of everything that's in the frame. So go ahead and focus on what it is you want to focus on, but then have a look around to make sure that what's there isn't competing 
with what it is you're trying to do. And you get shots like this all the time where somebody is talking and there's a flower coming out of their head and they don't see it because they're so <laughs> focused on the person. And it's up to you to say, okay, is everything in the shot what you want? Uh, the term I use is visual noise. Are we making sure that all the visual noise is out of the picture?